Hello, everyone. David, thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you for that very warm welcome. It's very nice to, <clears throat> to follow a political star like Michael Heseltine on an occasion like this. I I've been watching Michael Heseltine on, on platforms a bit like this one for maybe 35 years. Now, back then, Michael's hair was a bit blonder and mine existed, but time, <laughs> but time passes. It's, it's, it was good to see Michael in, in good form today. Now, I'm going to, um, as it says, I think, in the programme, I'll just talk for a little while about um, politics now, politics post-election, a bit of a trot around the, the post-election landscape, and then, and then maybe take a few questions from the floor if anyone cares to, uh, to throw any at me. I will do my best to answer them as honestly and frankly as I can, and those that I can't, I will evade as elegantly as I, as I possibly can. And so just a few, a few minutes then on the state of the nation. Now, that's rather a, a pompous way of describing this event. The Harrogate Conference Centre is a wonderful venue, but it's not the United States Congress. And the more observant among you will have noticed that I'm not Barack Obama, but I will do my, do my very best. And Michael resisted the urge when he started uh, with his, his remarks of a, of, of a show of hands, of seeking a show of hands. I'm going to yield to that temptation if I, if I may, and simply ask the question, on a show of hands, if you, if you will, looking back to the last election, because you can't really, I think, appreciate where we are without a quick look at where we came from. The last election, who found the results of the general election a few weeks ago really, truly surprising? Can I just ask that? That's very nearly, interestingly, unanimous. Not quite unanimous, but something very close to it. A second question, then. And when we look back at what happened in that election, when we look back at the results, who now finds that really quite easy to understand what happened in that election and why. And that's an almost identical number, a perfect working majority in both cases, which I, think, which I think is interesting, which I think tells us in itself quite a lot, which reflects my own view of the thing very, very closely. The, the result of the general election, when we look back on it, is very, I think, very easy to explain indeed, isn't it? The, the evidence and the reasons for taking a view of what seemed likely to happen in in May was there, not just for weeks and not just for months, but actually for, for years. When the, the polling day came along, there wasn't, as we know now, a huge shift uh, from, uh, of, of uh, uh, Labour supporters to Conservative supporters. That, that stayed reasonably static. The Tory vote held up and, and strengthened somewhat. A good many supporters who drifted from the Conservatives to the UK Independence Party drifted back again. That was obviously uh, a significant. We'll never quite know how much of that was due to worries about the Scottish National Party and, and the Labour leader being in hock to a Scottish National Party leader. That played a part. We can't uh, quite say how much of a part. What we do know, looking back, and from our, I think, our instincts and judging by the show of hands just then, was that there was a problem with the Labour offer. The opinion polls for months was telling us there was a problem on Labour's side with the perceived credibility of the party leader, Ed Miliband. There was a problem also with the way Labour was trusted, or rather was not trusted, on the question of the economy. Now, in election after election, we have seen examples of political parties winning an election despite having a problem with perceived credibility of the party leader. We have seen examples, one or two, where a, par a party has won a general election despite having a problem of credibility on the issue of the economy. We have never had an election where a party had problems on both of those front fronts and went on to win. And it didn't happen in this occasion either. Now, you, when I say this, um, you'll say, you would say that, wouldn't you? And I know you're gonna be feeling this, but I can, I can tell you that I've never really believed the opinion polls. I was boringly um, a persistent in the office in, in saying that to colleagues around the place. And, and it wasn't based in the end on, on scientific evidence because the scientific evidence of what was going on was simply absent. It was based on instinct, you know, a certain amount on what I felt was common sense and more, most of all, on just my contact with people in my own life, friends, family, people out there, in my bit of London, um, an evening in particular, in the East Dulwich Picture House, I live in, in East Dulwich, told me an awful lot about 10 days out from polling, picking up my youngest daughter at the Picture House, ended up talking to a, a table full of, 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 of friends and other parents about, about politics. I didn't want to talk about politics, I was trying to get away from politics for that evening, but it started, and before you knew what was going on, it was a kind of focus group in the East Dulwich Picture House. It turned out that just about all my friends on that occasion were Labour supporters and voters for some time back. Also it turned out that not one of them was voting Labour. And that, was, uh, that replicated my experience in previous days and weekends for some time back of people I know, many friends, who were supporting Labour and then had decided not to. There was, a, there was an issue there. There was obviously a problem 
for the Labour Party, which on that, on that evidence was invisible to the pollsters because these, the people I'm talking about, they would not have been sharing that with an opinion pollster if asked the question. And there was, there was a problem elsewhere in the, the so-called evidence, which turned out to be so, so flawed. And I'll go to another personal anecdote. On the Thursday before voting, there was a televised debate in Leeds. Well, I was up there to cover the debate. On the afternoon of that day, I took my daughter, who's studying um, at Leeds University, out for lunch with a friend. And we talked, turned to politics. And her friend um, from uh, Newcastle, upon time, her family and friends all around were Labour supporters from as far back as you care to know they weren't voting Labour either. And that replicated my experience in places like Hartlepool, where I was hearing this over and over again. Point is, there was an enormous hole in the Labour boat that was invisible to the pollsters. It was also invisible uh, to the party canvassers. And there it was, plain as the no nose on your face, when the votes came to be counted. And what do we learn from that? I think there could be no clearer example of the, the extent to which the world of politics and the world in which real people, as it were, live, if I can, just for the purpose of this, uh, ex exclude politicians from the world of real people. They are two different parallel universes. And where there should be a, a good deal of common understanding, mutual understanding, there is instead a huge amount of mutual incomprehension and failure to understand. And we see that over and over again. The evidence, I think, was what we thought was going to happen, what so many thought might happen on Thursday night, and what we woke up to on Friday morning. And I could extend that analysis into all sorts of other areas and a little later on I, I sort of will but we are now where we are and I'll go around the course at this point and talk about the Labour Party which is now in the business in the throes of finding a new leader uh, a new leader of the Labour Party clearly the party needs to have a a difficult long conversation with itself about what went wrong and how to put it right fact is a, a leadership contest in the Labour Party is the last possible place to have any such conversation and I think you see that at the moment, those, those of us who pay attention to the Labour leadership contest, and, and in that I think I'm referring to quite a small minority of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the British public at the moment, you can see it where candidate after candidate seem to be taking every possible pain to avoid saying very much at all. Um, you will not learn much about the future direction of the Labour Party from the, from the contest. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, is the man of the left who's in there, as it were, to give a bit of ballast. Um, he's got, if you like, the most comfortable job of all. He stands where he stands on the, the left, the hard left of the, of the Labour Party, and good luck to him. He's in a position which is, which is full of conviction and, and belief. It's also, in its own way, a very comfortable place to be. It's one of the most comfortable parts of the, of the comfort zone. Um, it probably accounts, in part at least, for the warm reception that he's getting as he goes around the country in the many, many hustings that are taking place. We don't expect Jeremy Corbyn to, to lead the Labour Party when the result is announced in, um, in, in July. We have uh, Yvette Cooper. Now, Yvette Cooper is interesting. I suspect she will, will do reasonably well, may even be the dark horse in the, in the contest. She has, I think, through her time at the top of the Labour Party, near the top of the Labour Party, very skillfully managed to avoid um, being tainted by any particular strong faction or strain of thinking in the, in the party. Some unkindly may suggest they have no idea what Yvette Cooper stands for. I would put it quite differently. I think she's wonderfully unburdened by preconceptions of what she stands for. And in, this, and, in this, and in this contest, that may turn out to be a very considerable asset. We shall, we shall see. Uh, Andy Burnham, of course, is the bookie's favourite, many people's favourite. I hear he is getting very good receptions up and down uh, the country. He's seen as being, if you like, the, uh, the leader of the, of the grassroots, the core, the core vote. Um, and that will stand him, no doubt, in good stead. We'll see if he ends up being a little bit too painted into that corner. And in the end... It come the second ballot, I suspect there would be a second ballot, we find that Yvette is the one racing up on the rail. I don't know, none of us can know uh, with this contest and with this electorate, but that's an interesting possibility to, to watch for. And Liz Kendall, she of course is the candidate of the hard truths. She's the outsider. And maybe because she too speaks from conviction, maybe she feels correctly she needs to rock the boat to have any chance of jumping into it. But it may be in that, in that process she's alienating at least as many people as she's attracting. And I know from you know, my own knowledge of the contest that she being tainted as she has been by the, the label of being a Tory, let alone being a Taliban uh, a Tory, I think that's hurting uh, the, the Liz Kendall campaign. So we'll see what happens when the votes are counted. It's going to be interesting. It could be close. No one is going to call it, I think, with anything like certainty between now and then. Um, the Liberal Democrats. I won't say too much about the Liberal Democrats, partly out of respect for private grief, although that... <laughs> In saying that, I, I don't wish to convey any, any lack of respect because it, it, is my, it is my 
my belief that the, the Liberal Democrats, in acting the, the way that they acted through the period of, of coalition, coalition government, behaved with nothing other than honour and integrity, and actually in the service of the national interest. And, those, and there were many, many uh, supporters of the Liberal Democrats who peeled away in disgust when the Lib Dems went into coalition with the, with the Tories, never quite understood why that should be. The Liberal Democrats always advertised themselves as the party of plural politics, uh, being ready to, to act as the ballast for the other two big parties, depending on how the mandate shook out at the general election. And that's exactly what they did. They paid a price. They knew they were walking into gunfire, and they ended up, as we've seen, uh, being mown down. I mean, I recall in the 80s, in this, in this hall, in this lovely conference centre, attending um, liberal... Uh, social and Liberal Democrat Liberal Party conferences here. Those were the halcyon days of, uh, of 1987 and 92 when the party had 20, 22 seats and about a fifth of the national vote. Those count now as the good old days, don't they? But um, you know, we'll see how they can climb back if they can climb back. I think it will be a long climb. And in the meantime, for my money, Nick Clegg deserves all of his portraits and busts in the National Liberal Club. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure that's going to be very much consolation you know, from where they are just at the moment. The UK Independence Party, briefly, briefly too, we know they performed well below many people's expectations. They've ended up with one leader and one member of parliament, which as it turns out is quite enough for a fundamental split. Um, <laughs> and even, an even su sufficient one member for a backbench rebellion, which takes a, <laughs> takes a bit of doing. But, but I don't think we should completely write off the UK Independence Party either. We're heading into a period, an interesting period, with a, U, with a, U, a UK membership of the European Union uh, in question, at least by the end of 2017, and sooner than that if, if David Cameron is able to, to manage things in the way that he would like. And we'll see. It, it, it may be, I suspect, that UKIP's day will dawn again, maybe not quite as brightly as it has in the recent past, but we shall, we shall see. It is possible, I think, that the UK Independence Party, even if the vote on EU membership goes the way of endorsing, re-endorsing membership, which is obviously uh, perfectly possible, and certainly looking at the latest opinion polls. If that's the case, it is still possible for UKIP to, uh, uh, to lose the vote and still win the argument. There are still concerns out there about such things as, as Britain's membership, such, such things as migration. And there will be no radical, complete overhaul of the system of migration within the EU at the end of this um, renegotiation. We know that. It is simply not possible. It is simply not on offer. And the, the UK Independence Party reflects a concern about that, which I think will find expression again. And on other things too. The, the UKIP party has, has, has become and has been a vehicle for protest and dissent of all different kinds. And it could be, it could be again, we will just see, but it's not over. I mean, they, they, as I say, could, could lose the vote if, if it is lost and, and win the argument in just the same way that the Labour Party is now um, privately, quietly concerned about the possibility of, 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 of winning the vote and losing the argument for the reverse, the reverse of all of these reasons, being again seen to be on the wrong side of some of these, uh, these public, public, public concerns. Which now brings me then to the, to the government, today's government, the Conservative majority government under David Cameron, who, trust me, right now can do no wrong at Westminster. He is somewhere between Moses, having sort of parted seas of political adversity and led the army through the middle, to, or Hannibal perhaps, having scaled mountains of, 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 of adverse political commentary to reach the other side in one piece and, and in pretty, pretty good shape. I mean, I have personally seen, I can share this with you, I've seen in the corridors of Westminster, around the, the lobbies and corridors there, I've seen elderly Conservative members of Parliament shuffle up to David Cameron to touch the hem of his garment in the, in the, in the, in the hope of curing their ingrowing toenails or... or <laughs> or digestive disorders. He has that kind of extraordinary supernatural aura about him just at the moment. And, and the party seems to be in a very compliant, rather grateful mood. Will that last in this way for very long? Well, probably not. It's not in nature and it's not in politics. But that doesn't mean it's going to all go to pieces anytime soon. Although, you know, there, there will be, and it is the natural tendency of political commentary to, uh, to, to be a prophet of doom. It may not be doom as quickly as some people might might imagine. It will not be easy either. But if you look at the Conservative Party on the question of Europe, they are surprisingly compliant uh, and willing to, uh, to say the right thing when asked the, the question. We only heard a few days ago David Cameron had accepted what, what was frankly inevitable, which is that it may not be possible to have a referendum before treaty change is achieved in the European Union. It will actually be almost impossible, pretty much impossible. The ratification process for a, a new treaty takes 18 months. It's given 18 months. And we could easily be in referendum territory long before that. It simply doesn't, doesn't work as a timetable. Um, 
But there was no great howl of protest from the Eurosceptics when that became clear or obvious, depending on your point of view. They know they've got a referendum coming and they're happy to wait for it. The, the challenge for the Tory party will come when the result and the vote is in. And then reconciling differences becomes a potentially challenging moment for the leadership, for David Cameron and the team in number 10 Downing Street. And we'll see how they manage that. Will he, before that time comes, give his ministers and others the freedom to campaign on either side of the line without necessarily leaving the government? We'll see. There are many who are insisting on that now. It may be that's the sensible way to go, to provide that sort of safety valve, especially if the polls are saying what they're saying now, which is that a, a yes vote is the more likely option. Then why cause yourself that kind of grief would be a reasonable question. There are other big questions too. I mean, the Human Rights Act, I'll just skate over one or two. The Human Rights Act is going to be an enormous challenge. Um, there are a queue of senior, respected conservatives in the, in the House of Commons who will not wear the idea of withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights for the, for, the, for the purpose of achieving homegrown legislation on human rights. People like Ken Clark, people like Dominic Grieve, the former Attorney General, Andrew Mitchell, the former Chief Whip. In the House of Lords, there are even more. Michael Heseltine, who was here a moment ago, I can imagine and I know what he'll have to say about it. And there'll be lots more with the same sort of view, which is that, that they will not sit quietly while that is done. And as we sit here today, there is no plan for how to accomplish um, the repatriation of of the power of British courts over human rights in this country. There's something like a blank sheet of, of paper. And he's one of those examples, I think, of a piece of, uh, of, of political policy that was sort of sketched in in light pencil in one or two lines in the anticipation of another coalition where the Liberal Democrats might have helpfully come along and said, you've got to tear that up and put it back on the shelf. It didn't quite work out that way. And so they've got to find a way through it. But even if, and I suspect this is very, very possible, the whole thing comes to almost nothing, would that be the end of the government? Would that be a catastrophe for the government? I'm not sure that it necessarily would. I can see that. Huge headlines, screaming, screaming headlines. People like me, breathlessly talking about what a disaster um, for the government on the Monday, Tuesday through to the Friday. But the following week, we might find there are other things to talk about. It is in the nature of political crises. They sort of come and then they, they just sort of go. Um, it may not be disastrous. And um, add to that in the background, the political project of David Cameron's Downing Street, which is hugely ambitious. It is to recreate the achievements of Margaret Thatcher in reaching across boundaries of class, or what we used to call class, and, and turning these red areas blue, finding recruits in areas that were otherwise off limits uh, to the Conservative Party, doing what Margaret Thatcher did, with a combination of, you know, the policies, tax, tax reform, raising thresholds at the lower and middle, middle end, the right to buy policy, which I'm guessing is not over necessarily enormously popular with everyone in this room, but it could have an, a, an effect in bringing in new, new supporters to the Conservative cause, childcare, and so on and so on. I could, I could go on, but you can see the project. How, Margaret Thatcher's example is there. Even more so, that of Tony Blair, who is the sort of household god of number 10, uh, Downing Street, who also managed to reach across those lines and bring in supporters in a way that no Labour leader had certainly managed to even attempt really before they would like Cameron would like to do something of that of the kind in the future and who's to say it can't be done and when you have a political project underlying it all which is pretty pretty relentless whether it is to do with boundary changes which could be significant very significant where you will have a majority now of 12 in the house of commons when you take into account deputy speakers and the like transformed into a majority touching 50 as a result of a, a sweep of the pen across boundary changes uh, to come. And when you add to that changes in party funding, where trade union members would have to opt positively into the option of the political fund, that could deprive Labour at a stroke of an enormous percentage of its, of its income and, and stack the deck still more. When you look at uh, English votes for English laws, those English MPs that are left, there'd be fewer of them if the plan goes as it's, as it's proposed, they would have more power. They would just have the ultimate say on English legislation and even English budgetary policy and English budget with rates of taxation. Put them all together and you have, well, the makings of a third term Conservative government now already in prospect without another election taking place. And then you have the subject which you, you'll be discussing uh, in, in the, over the next couple of days here, of course, English devolution. If that works, that could do still more. Um, for, the, for the Conservative cause, if it works. Obviously, that's an, an enormous if. There are obviously questions of funding. There are questions of, you know, can the, the model of cooperation that's proposed actually work uh, in practice? No doubt, in number 10, they would love the, the situation where if it works, they're getting the credit for it. If it does not, 
you guys will get the blame. They will subcontract the, the blame, which is a fairly eternal Whitehall way of looking at things, and we all understand how that game is played, but it might work the way they want it to be, uh, to be played. So, yeah, it's looking, it's looking possibly more promising than many people might imagine at the moment for this, this uh, majority Conservative administration when the time comes to vote again in 2015. Not that David Cameron will be there to see it, of course. He's not Nigel Farage. I don't expect him to unresign. I imagine he will, he will be gone, um, something like the timetable he's set out, which would be, I don't know, none of us know, sometime after the European referendum, maybe in good time for the, for the vote, although they won't say that out loud at this, at, this, at this point. It will be one of the others. It will be, who knows, George Osborne, quite, quite possibly. And the runners and riders are fascinating to, to take a, a look at. I mean, just look at a couple. George Osborne, just a few short months ago, I could not have imagined the idea, really, of George Osborne being a serious contender for prime minister and leader of the Conservative Party. Now I find it really quite easy to, uh, to imagine that. And it's not simply a matter of, um, of, the, of the skillful makeover that George has, has, has under, undergone lately, where he, he now looks quite a lot like Agent Bodie from The Professionals with a, a, new, a new haircut and a brisk way of going about, about the place. It is also the fact that he's gathering credit in the way that he is for the long-term economic plan, which you know, at the moment isn't doing too, uh, too, too badly. He's, he's a power in the, in the party and has been for a good long time, very close to that of David Cameron, though not in any way rivaling it in the way that we've seen with Gordon and Tony in the, the days of the, uh, the GBTBs. There is no replication of that at the top now, and George Osborne must be taken seriously as must Theresa May, of course, who, who uh, her ambition is pretty well, pretty well known. And I imagine we'll be seeing and hearing more of Theresa May in these coming, coming months and next couple of years. She will be just a little louder, a bit more forceful. Although to predict that Theresa May will over time become more forceful is probably the safest prediction I could possibly ever, ever make. And then there is Boris, of course, Boris Johnson. You know how we love to talk about, about Boris. I've never seen a politician with that power to reach across uh, boundaries of, of political allegiance, of class, of culture, of, of race. No one does it quite like Boris. And he's got a, he's got a remarkable competitive instinct, which he manages to, uh, to, to slightly veil a lot of the time. But it's there, and I speak with some knowledge. It wasn't too long ago that I, I was to take part in a celebrity boxing match on BBC Two. And my, and my, my, my opponent was at, a state, at one certain stage slated to be Boris Johnson. It never actually, actually happened. I tried to persuade him, and he did seem to be up for it for a while, but it came to nothing. The board of control, the British boxing, thought it might not be a good idea for middle-aged men to get in the ring and n knock each other out for the first time, and it didn't actually go ahead. But it would have been interesting, I think, Boris Johnson in the, in the boxing ring. Just, just imagine it just for a moment, Boris Johnson in the ring, about that height, he's quite wide, almost as wide as he's tall, Boris, with a low center of, of gravity and a way of sort of shambling about the place. With his white hair and pallid expression, he's a sort of, negative transparency of smoking Joe Frazier, don't you think? <laughs> but it didn't, and it would have been an interesting scrap, but never quite happened. And I, and I, I didn't come to talk about my boxing career, but the, my, the, the guy who I was actually finally slated to fight was the lead singer of Spandau Ballet, Tony Hadley. And you're, la you're, you're laughing, you're thinking you'd have had him easily, that's what you're thinking, but, but, but Tony Hadley, he may have been a lacy-shirted new romantic pop singer, but he's a six foot five uh, lacy shirted new romantic pop singer. And when, when it was called off, my deep disappointment was not entirely untinged with relief. But, um, <laughs> but that never came, came to be. It's going to be an interesting contest when the time comes, certainly in my trade, where we do, we do love these things. The challenge, of course, the great challenge, now facing this government, and I suggest increasingly over time, if the plan uh, for regional devolution takes shape in the way that's proposed, increasingly on your plate too, the business of bringing people closer to politics, understanding it more, caring about it more, re relating to it, to it more, really where we started off when we looked at that election, election result. And that, that's going to be a big job for whoever's there, whether it's number 10, whether it's, uh, whether it's you guys, and certainly whether it's, it's the likes of me in my trade. Certainly in my trade, we have a lot to answer for. I freely confess in the process which is now accelerating, which has been there for a while, but, but it's now accelerating, the process of public skepticism about politics, accelerating way beyond the line into deep, deep cynicism, which is a, a development which, which worries me. And is, it, there's nothing at all healthy about this cynicism, which is the daily currency of conversation on the subject of politics away from the Westminster, the Westminster bubble. But, and we see it, we see it over and over again. In the last general election, the turnout, you'll recall, was it was 65%. It was pretty much the same as the, the turnout in, in 2010. Go back five years, 
they were just hovering around 60% before that, just below 60%, the lowest turnout in a British general election since 1918. And in 1997, which politically, for those who are close up to politics, it was such an interesting and, and exciting times, whatever your, your politics, the turnout then was the lowest since 1935. The estrangement of people from politics is galloping at a, at a headlong rate. And it's, there's something worrying about all, all of that, I think. The, it's not justified. The, the worries about our politicians and, uh, and so-called sleaze is overcooked with a good deal of help from the media, I again confess. I've been doing this, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, for a long time, um, 35 years for different news organisations. Most of the members of parliament I've met in that time, and there have been many hundreds, have been decent, honest people who wanted something, nothing but something good for the country. That is not the general uh, perception. Spin, people would say politics is riven with spin. It's actually as old as politics and will always be with us. It's the job of people like me to push it aside rather than bang on about it too, uh, too much. And when it comes to other forms of sleaze like, well, like sexual uh, indiscretion, actually most people are more grown up about that stuff than, than many headline writers. And I, I personally agree with the analysis of the eldest son of David Lord, Lloyd George, um, William Lloyd George, who said politicians are really like monkeys. The higher they climb, the more likely you are to see their revolting bits. Which is a, which is a perfectly, a perfectly good, a good piece of. An, I thought you'd like that. A piece of, a piece of piece of analysis, and, um, and and it is worrying. It's not just worrying in an abstract academic sense. It's worrying for lots of reasons. We need people to be as close as possible to our politics. Apart from anything else, you will understand this more than most. The, the growing cynicism about our politics is a massive deterrent to good people wanting to get involved at all in, on any level. And the way we are moving all of us, we are putting good people off now and increasingly from wanting to get involved in public life or any kind of political role. And the result of that, of course, if it, if it goes on unchecked, is that no one will want to get involved in politics apart from uh, professional politicians and apart from political apparatchiks and apart from, God help us, political intellectuals. And there's a place for all of these people, but political intellectuals, when I say that I mean someone who you leave them alone in a room with a tea cosy, and they're not even tempted to try it on. I mean, these are not people I want to be governed by in any great, great number. And we're in danger of consigning our politics to that domain entirely. So, you know, between all of us, we, we need to be aware, more aware of the dangers of political cynicism and do whatever we can, you know, to try and arrest the, the headlong charge. And in the case of, of you guys, as you move into this new landscape of devolved administrations of services being brought together and not just um, greater cooperation with the centre in, in London but also between authorities, decision taking can easily become more and more opaque and what is now something of a problem of comprehension can become absolutely impenetrable uh, a government from, for so many people which will not help the process of accountability or, 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 or debate or, or, or understanding. So there's a problem here which are, it's an obvious one frankly but, but it's one which on occasions like this I occasionally like to throw in and throw out there, especially when I've got an audience like you who is so willing and kind uh, as to listen in the way that you have. So I'll take a few questions now, but thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, we, we'll have the, um, the number plates and the microphones if, if I can see any going up. There's a gentleman in the middle there. Uh, it's not my deputy leader. I'm sorry. There's a, not a, de a gentleman. It's my deputy leader. <laughs> Thank you. As David said, I'm Peter Martin, the deputy leader of uh, Surrey uh, County Council. Uh, John, thank you. Very interesting. I just wondered whether you could comment on the diminishing power uh, at Westminster. Over the last 50 years, Westminster has given away an empire, given half its powers to Europe, is giving away powers to Scotland, Wales, and Manchester. Uh, and uh, even individual responsibility of government ministers has been given away, like uh, the responsibility for setting interest rates, for instance. Where are we going to go in the next 50 years, and is there going to be anything left which is worthwhile? Yeah, well, I, I sense a certain, a certain you know, tone in, in the question, which, which tells me something of where you're coming from, I, I think. Um, and, and I guess the answer to that partly is, is with the, the individual. You can approve or disapprove of this trend, and you're right, you, of course you identify a trend which exists, and what you describe as giving away power, others might describe as sharing power. What you describe as, uh, as surrendering power, others might describe as bringing it closer to home. Now, I accept that that doesn't apply um, in the case of the European Union in the same way that it does to 
a regional government or to the Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Assembly, uh, and, and or for that matter, police and crime commissioners, um, while they're still with us, um, in, in the same way. But it is, it is, I think, a challenge. It is a challenge in the way that I identified a moment ago, I think, to the practitioners of politics in all of those spheres to keep in touch with the people who put them there, to try and do something to engage the public's interest, and you'll need the help of the likes of me absolutely before you, you pull me up on that, to, to achieve that, so that the turnouts in elections for, when it, whether it is the elected mayors, when, when and if we get elected mayors, or something better than we saw in the case of police commissioners, which was a truly wretched example of elective uh, politics in action. Of course, these, these gulfs need to be bridged. Where's it going? Well, where, uh, you can read the book. You know, it's there. It's, it's in your own um, LGA pamphlet accompanying this conference where you'd like to see it go. Will it work? I have no idea. You know, I simply have no idea, but I'm going to be as interested as you are engaged in the question. Okay. Number one, up at the top. Thank you. Uh, Martin Welton, London Borough of Merton. Um, what do you think the impact will be on international security issues on this government, given the events in Tunisia um, last week and the potential of future events happening? We saw this for the second Blair administration when 9-11 happened a few months um, after the election. And do you think it could have an impact in preoccupying government time? Well, I mean, it'll certainly occupy a good deal of of, of government time. I don't think there is a, a magic wand, clearly, to, to make the problem go away or solve it. I don't think a solution is, is available. I mean, there is no such thing, is there, as perfect security. We can't, we can't achieve it. If, if a, a lone maniac, or five of them, as it turns out, in Tunisia working together, can wreak havoc and take dozens of innocent lives on a beach resort in Tunisia, then where is safe? I mean, no one can be 100% safe. All you can do is do what, what is possible to enhance security. And we'll see you know, the EU security services strengthen. There'll be more resources for the security services, no doubt, in the coming spending, spending review. There'll be more powers for them. Um, there's a little more emphasis behind what has been called the snoopers, so-called snoopers charter. Um, the argument there tilts some, somewhat, although there will continue to be an argument about all of that. And when it comes to policy overseas, again, what really more can be done? At least what more can be done than the policy lines we've had set out already. Um, there is a, a conflict in which British forces are engaged in Iraq and in Syria from the air. I don't imagine we'll see troops on the ground, boots on the ground, as a result of the uh, last weekend outrage at all. I think there'll be more effort to bring together the powers in the region to do something about that. Some of the Arab states, who it is thought could do more to isolate um, uh, ISIL and, and deprive it of funds and all of that sort of thing. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, hopefully progress can be made. And we're told that something like five major plots have been, have been stopped in recent months. And that's in its way very, very encouraging. But we cannot have perfect security. Maybe we need a new, a new mindset. I was struck very recently by Min Campbell, a veteran liberal Democrat, who drew a comparison with World War II and, and said, well, back in World War II, uh, the British people didn't expect perfect security. There was, a, there was a sense that if your number's up, your number's up, which is a terribly dark and and fatalistic way of looking at things. But from one point of view, that's sort of where we are now and where we are sort of headed. OK, I've got um, number four up there. And then up, there's a gentleman who's had his hand up here right across in the far corner. If somebody could go to him, please. Number four. Um, Dave Wilcox, um, chair of the Labour Group in Derbyshire. I'd, um, John, can I just confirm with you that um, Ed Miliband got as many votes in 2015 for Labour as Tony Blair did for Labour in 2005. It was the way the others voted that was the problem. <laughs> the bastards. <laughs> now, th there's also a second point as well, <laughs> is that I don't think many of us saw the SNP coming from where they came from and as quickly. And do you share my view that they could vanish as quickly as that in the next five years? Well, to, to, to take the last point first, I don't necessarily think that's likely um, at all. I, th I think when you have a, a sea change, as we've seen in Scotland, of the scale we've seen in Scotland, it tends not to subside no, no. in a hurry. Um, there, are, there are Holyrood Scottish Parliament elections coming up in May. There are local government elections coming up 
um, as well on the same sort of time scale. And the general expectation will be the SNP will do extraordinarily well there too. I think they will give they will be given the run that the Scottish people show every sign of wishing to give them. And I think the Labour Party in Scotland has got a steep climb back. That's not to say that it's impossible, but I think it will be uh, quite a steep, steep climb. And why did it, why did it happen? I mean, well, there were lots of different reasons. One was, I think, a predictable um, reaction to the referendum last September, where in many cases, national feeling took a second place to, a, to more cautious or, I don't know, more guarded instincts, you know, depending on your, your point of view. Um, the general election gave a second outlet, a chance to, as it were, have your cake and eat it. And, and that came through, spurred on by the, for many Scots, the infuriating side of Labour Scottish politicians campaigning on the same, the same battle bus, as it were, as the Conservative Party, which, which cost the Labour Party heavily. Gordon Brown saw that at the time, and he was, it turns out, right about that. But behind all of that, there was a longer, a longer term trend, where during those years of Conservative rule under Margaret Thatcher and then John Major, the Labour Party successfully mobilised uh, the, the sense that Scotland was a, a discreet uh, political entity with the perfect right to express itself and have, a, have some self-determination. And that worked against the Conservatives pretty well for, for, for some years. In the end, it sort of it blew a hole in the Labour boat too. And so from that point of view, that argument turned back on itself and, and bit Labour very, very heavily. Um, as I say, we'll see how, if that process can be reversed and over what what sort of time scale? Um, your point earlier on, I agree with both of your points, and I, I sort of touched on them in that, in that, in that brief talk. Labour, they didn't lose a lot of voters or support directly to the Conservatives, but they needed to gain. And on normal, the normal swings and roundabouts, such as they exist, they would have gained uh, more than they, they did, but it, it didn't happen. And even to the point that, you know, hours before um, the votes were announced, the Labour Party, many of them, were convinced that there was a Labour administration waiting to, to take shape, but it just didn't, didn't happen that, that way. Um, it wasn't spotted by too many people at all. You know, one or two on the Tory High Command were, were bold enough to say they felt they were going to win the election, but there weren't too many, too many of, of those. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Labour didn't achieve what, in normal circumstances, you might argue they perhaps ought to have achieved, and that was the problem. And the roots of that, I think, were plain to see, as plain as the nose on your face, really. And, and I don't suggest Ed Miliband should be castigated for this. Ed Miliband is a highly intelligent, highly uh, compassionate, highly thoughtful man. Um, and not all intelligent people are thoughtful at all, but he's all of those things. But it wasn't quite the package that enough people were willing to buy in that swing centre uh, of, of, of the country that decides a British general election. Okay, I'm conscious of time. We've got number one and number two. And there's a lady down here trying to ask a question if somebody will come down with her afterwards. In the red. John, um, it's Cormac Smith from Westminster City Council um, and I'm a communications advisor working with clients across local government. Thank you very much for a um, fascinating and incisive canter around the post um, election landscape. You finished off by talking about increasing cynicism in politicians. Now, the first thing to say is that local politicians, almost every survey which is done shows that local elected representatives enjoy greater trust than national politicians. Putting that to one side, I think everything that we have heard and everything that we are expecting about the, how the austerity for local government is going to continue t between now and the end of the decade, and with that there will be real substantial changes to valued services. What would your advice be? What to local politicians in particular and officials like myself, what do we need to do to win and keep the trust of local people? Well, I should say it's really, I'm not in the business of giving advice of that, of that kind, you'll understand. Um, I'm an observer rather than a, 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 a participant in that, in that sense. But I absolutely accept what you're saying. It's going to be a serious challenge. And Michael Heseltine doesn't know the depths of the cuts to come, and he'd be much more likely to know the depth of them than I would. But we know uh, this is an unprotected area of government spending. And when, and when you're outside the realm of, of, of health spending, education spending, or at least a chunk of education spending, um, overseas development and so on, it becomes correspondingly tougher. And so the local government budget will feel a, a painful, painful squeeze. How do you cope with that? Well, as, well, as best you can, I suppose. And, and if, if it comes to dealing with your electorates, I don't know, directness of approach. Just, Bill Clinton used to say, you never stop communicating. 
which I think we always thought was very good advice. Whether that, that wins the day for you, I really don't know. I think the, all I can predict for you, as I, I think I'm for a number of people in these remarks this afternoon, is, is promise a fairly difficult time ahead and to genuinely wish you well with it. Okay. I'm going to take the last two questions together. Number two and the lady in red, number one. Uh, and that's, can I ask the questions to be short, sharp and decisive? Thank you. David, that's not fair, is yeah, it? I can't promise uh, the same for the answer. But. Ian Stewart uh, from Cumbria, and firstly, congratulations, David, upon your um, promotion. Um, John, uh, election 2015, what's next? Um, there's a lot of uh, introspection with us politicians. How about your profession? Because uh, your profession uh, was, was way, way off the mark. Um, uh, are, are you guys uh, doomed? Um, uh, do we... <laughs> Do, do we need to get rid of you guys? Um, Thank you, Ian. Uh, it's okay. On, on, on the matter of uh, engagement, um, I only managed 77.2% turnout at my district council election, so I must try harder next time, mustn't I? Yeah, you really must. <laughs> no, um, the and the lady. Yeah, I'll take, 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 take them both together, yeah. yeah. Hello, Jenny Lynn from Calderdale in West Yorkshire. Um, I wonder, John, if you'd like to say something about how long you think it's going to take before people start to get disillusioned with some of the promises that were made. Here in Halifax, where I'm based, um, we had they th the, the Conservatives threw the whole of the leadership team in. We had David Cameron, we had um, Osborne, we even had, um, we even had Boris Johnson come up and tell us that we were going to have this wonderful electrified railway system and everything. It's taken less, the less than eight weeks for them to go back on it. We even had them tell us that, they'd be, that David Cameron personally would make sure we kept our A&E. We don't believe that either. How long is it going to be before the, uh, the glow wears off? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll take the last, your, your question first then. Um, will the glow wear off? Yes. Um, will it wear off quickly? Probably. Um, from one point of view, that there isn't really that much of a glow um, outside of the political, the, the, the field of active um, politics about the, the new administration. As I say, they, they enjoy massive approbation from their, from their own, and from, especially from members of parliament who might have thought they weren't likely to be there, and now they they are. David Cameron walks on water. But the last election was less a popularity contest as an unpopularity contest. It was not about who was going to win. It was about who was going to lose most miserably. And, and in the end, it was the Conservative Party that lost least miserably. There was not a huge amount of enthusiasm for any of the offers on display. And I don't think I, I predict next time will be vastly diff different in that regard. There are reasons to think they may be different, and I, and objectively and impartially, I sort of hope the trade of politics and the business of politics is held in higher esteem, you know, a few years down the line than perhaps it is now. But I wouldn't put the mortgage on, on that either. And as for disillusionment with promises on offer in the general election, well, that, when has that ever taken very long? I mean, it, it is in nature, it is in human nature to feel let down almost as soon as you put down the stubby pencil in the, in the, in the polling booth. Um, we'll see the outcome of all of this, and I don't know what that's going to be. I've, I've discussed briefly how, quite skillfully, the present administration is laying the foundations of the beginnings of a road towards a third term. That doesn't mean it's gonna, gonna get there first. We don't know, this is five years, and a lot happens in five years. Look at Europe. You know, we don't know what's gonna happen in Europe by the end of this week, or by the end of today. Yeah. Never mind, never mind, you know, five years down the line. Now, these things are inextricably bound up in the economic fortune of this of this country and in that way also with the political fortune and there are other massive unknowns too north of the scotland england border how is that going to play out when will the scottish national party take uh, the time judge the time is right for another go another bite of the cherry i don't know i think perhaps rather they'll play a longer longer game than some people imagine i don't think they're going to jump at that in the may um hollywood parliament election for example i'd be surprised at that when they go for it they will know they will have to win they, a second defeat would be game over and so they won't rush to that. I think they feel they have wind behind them and they'll choose, choose their moment. They're pretty canny, canny political operators and it's gonna be fascinating to watch. I hope that answers at least some of your, some of your questions. And the earlier question, um, yeah, should we um, pundits and forecasters be ashamed of ourselves? Yes, absolutely. I, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm all, all contrition about, about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Having said that, as I, I, I accurately told you, I never quite believed the opinion, opinion polls, and this is just a moment of mitigation, if you like. Having taken the medicine, um, it would have been quite improper for me to, to sound off and offer predictions on the basis of gut instincts and, and the, the, the experience of, 
of coffee with friends and people dropping by and a few people I bump into on the streets around the country. So there was a kind of a pass there, but, the, but our general tone missed it and got it wrong. We spent an awful lot of time talking about post-election politics in the light of opinion polls, which turned out to be uniformly wrong. And there's obviously a lesson to be learned uh, from, that, from that too. And trust me, the lessons are being taken aboard and the, the, the scars on my back are at the moment invisible to you. But that, I can feel them. Okay. Thank you very much, John. I, I'd just like to end by saying, I think John hit a really important point about communication. It's about how we communicate with our residents. And when we stop doing that, we get the result that the ballot box deserved to give us, and that is we don't get elected. So for me, it's always been about how do we represent our residents, how do we listen to them, and how do we do our best. And when we stop listening to commentators and actually listen to the residents, I think we find the residents usually have the best answers. Sorry, John. Uh, Absolutely. But, uh, but on that note of um, thanks from John for his uh, really enlightening speech about the next election and what will happen after 2015, can I ask us all to show our appreciation to John? Thank you. Thank you very much.